work, last video we talked about the best sensory panel practices. In this video, I want to talk a little bit more about the different kinds of sensory tests that you can do with your panel, especially to train them initially. So let's get to it. Is he cute? Is he cute? The most common type of sensory analysis tests are discrimination tests and we use this when we want to determine if two samples are similar or different. So we want to see if there's a statistically significant difference between the samples. Discrimination tests are typically tests that are performed very quickly and they can be performed by trained panelists or people that have no experience whatsoever. So these tests are divided into two categories. The first is overall difference. So we want to know if there's just any kind of difference between two samples or an attribute difference where there's a specific attribute that's singled out such as bitterness. And we want to know if there's a difference just in that attribute for two samples. Let's talk about overall difference tests first. We have the triangle test the duo trio test and the two out of five test. So when I was taking a sensory analysis course, they helped train our palates by purchasing flavor active uh, capsules. And these are little capsules with um, off flavors that are common in beer, such as diacetyl, which is buttery, caramelly flavor. Um, I just wanted to quickly go on to the Flavor Active website and show you their flavor standards that they have. They have one just for beer and you can see here all the off flavors. Um, we'll click on to acetaldehyde which is uh, tastes like pink thinner or green apples depending on how high the concentration is and it's a whopping 65 British sterling pounds which is quite a lot for just a flavor. And you could buy these little uh, flavor active packets and you could pour it into samples to give it that off flavor. And so to test us, they would start by doing three times the threshold for diacetyl. And that's the threshold is the minimum level which someone is able to detect that off flavor. And so they put it at three times the threshold. So we would definitely be able to taste it and we would talk about uh, diacetyl and what it is and how that off flavor is produced during the brewing process. And usually we would do a discrimination test where they'd have some samples of beer in front of us and some of them would have three times the threshold level for diacetyl and then gradually we would go to a lower and lower threshold, so three times, two times, and then just at the threshold level where you're supposed to be able to taste it. Um, and that's how they would train our palates to detect these flavors and to identify them, is really through using these discrimination tests, which are the most popular. <laughs> In triangle tests, we want to see if there's a detectable difference between two samples. The assessors will receive three coded samples and they're told that two of these samples are the same and one is different. Using their senses, they need to identify which sample is the odd one out. In general, you should have 20 to 40 people do this test. Since there's a one out of three chance of choosing the right one, we'll also need to use statistical tables to determine how many correct responses are needed to see if there's really a statistically significant difference. During this test, we also shouldn't allow assessors to answer that there's no difference. We should force them to make a decision. So I just wanted to show you one of the triangle tests that we did in school. And so in this class, we had three triangle tests. Um, the first was a set of three samples of water. The second one was uh, hops and 
Then the last one was some beer and we were trying to see if one of them was different. So I think for the first two, one was some old, some brewery water, someone's tap water, tap water. I think I got this one wrong. I think this was the odd one out, but I wasn't able to tell the difference. This one was really hard to, to figure out. So actually, there were 13 people that did that triangle test and seven of the people got it right. So they picked the correct odd sample out, which was 933. I got that wrong. Um, so not enough people got that right. So we couldn't tell if there was actually a statistically significant difference between the tap water and the brewery water. For that one, we have to assume that there's no, well, at least for our test, there's no difference. And the second and the third one, you can see I wrote reject null, which is the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is just where you assume there's no difference. And so because we're rejecting null, that means we're saying that there is a statistically significant difference. When I say that there's a statistically significant difference, um, we have to tell that by going to the back here and you have a bunch of tables that will allow you to determine whether there is a statistical um, difference. So I don't want to get too much into it, but um, for our level of significance, we were using an alpha risk of 0 0.05 and there were 13 replies so you can see we just needed eight people to get it right and we got 12 people for the hops one so that's why we were able to reject the null hypothesis i hope that kind of made sense um there's a lot of um there's a lot of methodology behind this that i don't really want to get into but that's a quick overview. Again, in the duo trio test, the goal is to see if there's a detectable difference between two samples. Just like the triangle test, we have three samples here. It's statistically less significant than a triangle test as the chances of getting the right answer is higher at 50%. So here, there are three samples. Um, and one is labeled with an R, so you know it's the reference sample, while the other two samples are coded. The assessor just has to find which one of the coded samples is the same as the reference sample. Also shouldn't allow assessors to answer that there's no difference. We need to force them to make a decision so that we have enough data to plug into our statistical table to see if there's a statistically significant result. For the two out of five test, we only use it when we have a very small number of panelists. Two are the same and the other three are also the same, but from a different set. The chances of guessing two out of five samples correctly is just 10%. So that makes this test very statistically efficient, but it's also strongly affected by sensory fatigue and memory effects. So that means because there's more samples, a panelist palette might get tired of testing so many different samples. So now we've looked at the overall difference test and now I want to talk about the attribute difference test which are the paired comparison tests and the ranking tests. So in these kind of tests we're trying to measure a single attribute and it's important to keep in mind that even if we don't find a statistical difference in that one attribute it doesn't mean that there isn't an overall difference between two samples. A paired comparison test only involves two samples, so the assessor just has to say if they're different or not different. This type of test has a very low statistical efficiency since the probability of an assessor selecting a sample is 50%. 
The hardest part of a paired comparison test is deciding whether the test is one-sided or two-sided. If the test is two-sided, that means that there's no expectation about the results of the test. So let's say we're trying to figure out if there's a difference in bitterness between two beers. If the test is two-sided, that means there's no expectation that one of the samples will be more bitter than the other. Whereas if we say the test procedure is one-sided, then we have an expectation that one of our samples is more bitter than the other one. Our other attribute test is just a simple ranking test. And so we would just have three to six samples in front of the assessor and they would just rank the samples in order of the intensity of the attribute being measured. So again, if we're measuring for bitterness, then they'll just rank the samples from what they think is the least bitter to the most bitter. I also want to point out that here in this demo of me doing a sensory evaluation, you can see I have some unsalted crackers in front of me and also a cup of water. It's important to rinse your palate after tasting each of the samples and cleansing your palate by eating some unsalted crackers. I hope you enjoyed learning about sensory analysis and specifically discrimination tests, which are one of the most popular tests used to train new sensory panelists. In the meantime, please support this channel by giving this video a thumbs up, leaving a comment down below, or hitting that subscribe button. If you're interested in brewing, distilling, or drinks, then make sure you hit that subscribe button or check out my website. This is Brewbird, sending good vibes your way. I'll see you next time. He's cute. Wait, take a little picture of us. Okay. Oh.